I'm your host, David, and welcome to the Cold War channel. I am joined today by Dr. DJ Kenny, who teaches history of the environment at Marquette University in Wisconsin. Uh, he holds a PhD in the history of science with a focus on the Cold War, nuclear technology, nuclear policy, and nuclear weapons. Um, he is the host and founder of his own podcast, Cold War Vault, which I am a really big fan of. Go check it out after you've watched this, but definitely go check out Cold War Vault. Um, and Cold War Vault is actually a pilot program for uh, DJ's Mars Dog Media Project, uh, which is a multimedia publishing group for new humanities scholars seeking an alternative to uh, academia. Um, we've, he's spoken on nuclear weapons policy in government, uh, military, and the sciences, and he is the author of the most complete and current uh, work on the nuclear weapons program at uh, Amchitka Island in Alaska. Um, and welcome to the show, Dr. Guinea. Thanks, David. It's great to be here. Really That's, happy. Uh, really, that, uh, yeah. re really a pleasure to have you on. Um, as I said, I've been listening to the podcast for uh, about a year and a half now. Um, so it's really exciting to have you here. Um, one of the episodes, actually, the one of the original episodes that I listened to um, when I first found your podcast was covering a topic that is actually relatively, I feel is actually relatively unknown, but the impact that it has um, is quite far reaching um, through the, especially the early Cold War period um, in the US, especially in terms of its nuclear weapons policy. And that's a, a little something called the Net Evaluation Subcommittee. Um, and that's really what I'd like to talk about and focus on in our conversation today. Um, so to begin with, um, what I'd ask is, well, what is the Net Evaluation Subcommittee? Um, who was it and what, what was its role? Uh, the, it's a series, multiple episodes. For, <laughs> the, uh, for, for, Net, evaluation, <clears throat> Net Evaluation Subcommittee was uh, a subcommittee of the National Security Council. So the National Security Council can generate these subcommittees to do studies for any, anything that might be valuable at the time. So uh, uh, water security and, and the environment right now. At the time, it was a, a net evaluation <clears throat> of the Soviet capabilities. So the, the NESC, the Net Evaluation Subcommittee, its bigger title might be uh, Sub, subcommittee for the net evaluation of total Soviet nuclear capabilities at the moment and five years down the road. And, and so that's what it was. Uh, the people that made it up, uh, they would have been analysts. A lot of them are anonymous, remain anonymous. Analysts within the Department of Defense, <clears throat> within, the, uh, within the Pentagon, uh, it, it, was, it was chaired by um, a, a, one of the, it rotated, but one of the uh, uh, generals uh, in the Pentagon at, at any given time. But the, the, the individual, individuals that made it up, they were really just uh, quants. They were quantitative analysts that just cycled numbers. And it was really when they, they brought this annual report to the National Security Council. Uh, the president was always was always in attendance <clears throat> until the, the very end. And we'll talk about that, I'm sure. But the president was always in attendance, the vice president, all of the key members of the National Security Council. And that's where it really had its impact. So, um, so uh, who did it report to? Uh, the National Security Council. Okay. Uh, and um, so what was the, in terms of the, the quantitative analysis that it's doing, what, what, what is... Like, what was it analyzing? Like, what was the purpose of the reports that were being generated? Now, see, this is really interesting <clears throat> because it, it it is a very much a Western, a U.S.-led Western analysis of military capabilities. So, what I mean by that is they 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 looked at net nuclear capabilities, delivery capabilities, with some. Uh, some theater tactical capabilities as they related to that. But mostly it was uh, uh, nuclear capabilities. So uh, as, as the years went by, strategic 
air delivery systems, mm -hmm. rocket forces delivery systems, and submarine launch delivery systems. <clears throat> and uh, and those those three elements of the of the Soviet force. But uh, that would be really alien to the Soviets because they were always looking at the US. I, I mentioned this because it's part, part of the, the newest episode, but they were always looking at, sure, the, the net, net, net nuclear delivery capability of the US, but also how did that play into uh, allies around the world and who was on their side, who was on the US, the side of the US and, and NATO allies. And so they had a much, uh, much more complex understanding. So, so the uh, the net evaluation subcommittee's analysis was uh, fairly rudimentary through its entire run, but particularly in the beginning, it it was almost uh, at the level of a uh, a tabletop strategy game. They they have forty, we have fifty, we win. So yeah. okay, that's. <clears throat> um... So, I mean, part of what the NESC reports were doing was, or the net effect anyways, from what I've gathered and understood, was that it was almost a calculation, as you just said, who, that it's based on the assumption that a nuclear war could be winnable based on the, the amount of armaments that would have been in play. Yeah. Um, so what does, what did winnable mean? Um, and that's probably at the core of all this, especially through the 50s, um, when the U.S. really did have a dominance um, in terms of net nuclear forces. Um, but what, what, what did the U.S. sort of consider winnable to mean in a, a nuclear conflict? In the first years uh, of the Eisenhower, so th this, this organization was founded and had a couple of iterations over over two years before it became what we call the the net evaluation sub, subcommittee, but it was it had the same role, and it was always under Eisenhower here, and uh, and so in the first years you you see a you see the president in the minutes of the National Security Council after uh, after hearing the report in one instance. I believe it was in the 52 report. Uh, he said, uh, or 1953, he said, the Soviets, they must be, the Russians, they must be scared as hell. So it was because that first report said, we, they, they have nothing. We already have this many and the delivery capability. Yep. And, they, and it was absolutely uh, asymmetrical. That was over in less than 12 months. Within a couple of years, you get some famous quotes from Eisenhower, like, uh, <clears throat> like uh, hum humans can only take so much, or, or uh, I, I might want to take off for the Argentine. You know, <laughs> he's he's he's, re he's ready to go because because these these missile forces start to attain parity. Right. And uh, and uh, and so in the in the beginning, it was easy to sort of calculate, yes, we'll lose some forces, but almost almost if I can just go on for a little bit, I please. Don't. No, no, please. Uh, <clears throat> there were uh, one of my one of my favorite. Why well, I think it, it was an accurate calculation at the time, but I think it was misleading over time. Was. Uh, <clears throat> <clears throat> the uh, the Tupolev bombers, the Soviet bombers, well, they couldn't get home. Mm -hmm. They could definitely bomb Chicago and New York and Seattle, and 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 and, and maybe land in Mexico. No one ever asked the Mexican government what they thought about that. But uh, but they couldn't get home. And so the whole calculation, and this is another calculation this group was doing, was, well, do these bomber crews, are they, are they diehard patriots to the point that they're going to go, every one of them is going to go on a suicide mission and then maybe land in the Arctic or land in Mexico or, or ditch in the sea 
uh, or will you just see the uh, sort of attrition? No, no one's going to do this, and and the war would be over on the first day without these bomber crews. And and that was the that was the kind of calculation that was that was being done. Well, it's pretty soon after that you have uh, bombers that can make it home, and uh, and other targets, and also of course. Uh, navies uh, and and the submarine launched ballistic missile systems that come into play later in Eisenhower's administration and then it then it's really up in the air so <clears throat> i believe the question was uh you know how how were these things calculated well you could lose chicago but is it really realistic that you're going to lose new york and and, and seattle and san francisco and if you did, is that the end of the American economy? Probably not. But at the same time, we can send enough to end the Soviet economy. And that and that was a, a major calculation, at least through the first five reports to the Eisenhower administration. It, was, uh, it had a lot to do with industrial capacity and what can we lob and what can, we, what can they lob and what can we absorb? So, and uh, mm-hmm. so out of just to speak or to ask a question specifically to that, that's very much then, especially in the early days, focused on the amount of industrial destruction as opposed yep. to anything to do with population loss or civilians. Right. Okay. <clears throat> that's true. The, uh, the civilian loss was incorporated into the reports and it's always, um, it, it's always a part of it and a part of the narrative and, uh, uh, eventually, the uh, let's see, I have a, a note or two here. You know, it's just my notes. <laughs> some some light reading. That's... Some light reading. <laughs> uh... Stay in school, kids. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, it's often attributed to, uh, to to Eisenhower. I've never actually found any evidence, and it's and it's iffy. But but it's the the. Uh, by the end, uh, and we'll we'll get there, especially with the next generation of weapons, talking about this. But Eisenhower said, eventually there won't be enough uh, bulldozers to bury the bodies. And, and so the civilian calculation became really important, but not because of any kind of intrinsic ethical or moral uh, calculus. It was because, well, who's going to run them run the factories? Who will continue the wartime industrial production when there's no one left to even dig the survivors out? And then things became very complicated for Eisenhower. But that wouldn't be for uh, five or six years after the the first reports. Interesting. Um, so how, I mean, acceptable losses? I mean, that's sort of been a collateral damage, acceptable losses. I mean, these are expressions that have been used in warfare for centuries millennia however long you want to look at it mm-hmm. but moving into a nuclear war obviously like what does what does accessible acceptable losses mean like how is that how is that calculated um was there a pro- like a process or a formula or anything that that was used like consistently over time did it change with each report each year um and how did like what sort of determinations were there determination for specific targets that they the committee would assume would be hit or was yeah. it more of a, a nebulous percentage type thing uh, it did change every year uh, the 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 committee dealt with a spectrum an immediate attack and three to five years and it varied but three to five years down the road what will the Soviets be capable of three to five years down the road they, uh, the, the reports early on had a large national percentage casualty, um, sometimes as low as 15%, and some, which, which was absolutely uh, acceptable. And I don't have the US uh, population in 1953, but it's a significant number of people you know but mostly concentrated in 
urban industrial areas and areas around military facilities, which were also in, in um, urban areas, if not urban industrial. And then as, uh, as time went on, it did break out into individual uh, classes. So at least three tiers. Uh, there was the, the sole military facility, mm -hmm. okay? And that had almost no civilian casualties. Many of them, as time went on, were more remote or isolated. Then you had the mixed urban industrial, and that, those were industrial targets. And then you had solely civilian targets, which would have been um, an attempt on the part of the, the war fighting parties to reduce the number of people that were able to come out of the rubble and rebuild the country in time to launch some kind of, and again, we are talking World War II, Korea level tactical and strategic thinking here. Yep. It involved nuclear weapons, but this isn't the kind of, this isn't the kind of global thermonuclear war that uh, we see it by the 1980s. We're still thinking in terms of, well, you know, how can we, can we build tractors? Can we come back and replace the electrical grid? Can we get up and running faster? Because that's how you win. So as time went by, uh, they did start to break it out into those three tiers at least. And, uh, and, it, it, and so that became a more complex cal uh, calculation. Could, uh, could we lose the military fighting capability and maintain the industrial capability? And how far off the rails had thing, would things go if the Soviets started to attack, well, they're Soviets, evil communists. <laughs> they could uh, just attack purely civilian, uh, uh, civilian centers. And what would that do? So yeah, it, it became a very, a much more comp year by year, much more complicated in terms of analysis of what was an acceptable loss. And I will say that by the time that uh, I believe notes, yeah, by the time Eisenhower was wholly disenchanted, uh, it was something like 60% of the entire US, United States population. And, and that was no longer uh, a viable post-war scenario. So, so the, it, did, it did get up to 60% 6, in the analysis, yeah. Now, those numbers, and I don't, I think, I think I'd read somewhere that in the early, especially the early reports, the casualties were based strictly around blast damage and nothing to do necessarily with longer term casualties from the result of fallout mm. or infrastructure damage and cl collateral from that's a terrible term. Um, at what point especially did fallout sort of become factored into that to cha help change that from well, 15, 15% to 60%? Mm. That's a, now that is a great question because it, it has a surprise element. I always like these. You expect that the that Eisenhower and the Atomic Energy Commission and the Joint Chiefs of Staff had their they secretly knew. And and that's not borne out at all. They simply didn't incorporate fallout uh, and longer term radiation uh, effects radiation casualties um, in, into these calculations, <clears throat> it, it would seem that they truly uh, believed that they would be transient effects. Because all of this, remember, the only live fire test, tests are Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and uh, very recently, you know, at that point, would, it, would have been... Um, would have been the thermonuclear tests in at Bikini Atoll, yeah. and and uh, and so and that was very new science. They were in no way confident of uh, understanding that. And and the story of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, as horrible as it is, 
was that uh, some people died, but they still didn't have any kind of long-term <clears throat> data on that. And a lot of people got very sick and then got well again <laughs> because radiation uh, sickness, radiation poisoning is, a, is, is such, a, such a finicky thing. It's just very complex. And they just didn't have any sort of data. So it, seemed, it seems, looking at the historical record, that all of these people that you think were in some kind of conspiratorial cabal uh, to, to screw over the global population, they didn't know either. So once that data started to become clear, it became clear to the Atomic Energy Commission and to government entities uh, in the US, also in Britain, simultaneously, and, uh, and, and so throughout NATO, and it was not secret. That was very much in the public domain. And so it became a public issue. Fallout became a major public issue. So they started to uh, fold that in to these, um, to these subcommittee reports. And once you see that, the, uh, you see <clears throat> your, blast, your blast damage and your casualties through fire and blast your initial, and then you see the immediate to two weeks down the road, and that just swells these numbers extraordinarily. And they still didn't have the data, but there was the there was the assumption that there was going to be some kind of long term issue, and so there are some addendums to these reports that 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 address that. But. Uh, uh, I hope I think that was uh, I hope that answered the question. Around. Yeah, and it actually ties into sort of what my next question was going to be. So I mean, would would you would you say that the introduction of like the the hydrogen bomb with Ivy Mike and then with RDS um, six mm-hmm. by the Soviets is that really sort of where the that threshold changed, or was that even still further down the road, sort of where that that knee point is? in terms of where those ca- that casualty rate starts to be calculated differently? It was further down the road. Um, because, yeah, because uh, <clears throat> the bigger these weapons got, there was, there was a notable uh, d- decline in effectiveness. It, I, if I could draw it in a precise slope. So the bigger and bigger it gets, then you get to to uh, you know, the biggest ever, the R- RDS-220, uh, the often misnamed Tsar bomb. And um, it was not really very useful at all. Let's assume you could fly it over. Well, the amount of damage it could do was about the same as two far smaller bombs, and you'd get your planes back. So the, the bigger things got... There's one except the, the bigger things got, the uh, the more it became a, sort of a saber rattling show of force, as opposed to a, a, an effective um, an effective uh, military strategy or, or weapons delivery strategy. Two things about that. One thing that's always bothered me was that it has you can edit this right out. Because it has, <laughs> you know, it's always bothered me. It's in, it's in the popular consciousness about these very big bombs. <clears throat> it comes from Peter Coran's um, documentary film Trinity and Beyond, mm-hmm. in which he interviewed the archivist at Los Alamos, I believe. And he, uh, the archivist said that, well, they, they built bigger and the Soviets built bigger and bigger bombs because they didn't didn't have accurate missiles. And it's uh it, it over the over the 30 years that film's been out. I've tried to contact him probably five times. It's never never gotten an answer. I find it to be wholly untrue. The largest of their bombs weren't meant to be delivered by missile. That's one uh, issue. The other is, it, uh, it's also, <laughs> it's when you have a bomb 
that's even modestly sized, like a, like a one megaton bomb, it doesn't matter if it's a kilometer off center. It was, it's, it was never, it, if it's a population killing weapon of a multi megaton design, it doesn't matter what neighborhood it lands in, in to, Brooklyn. Tw- 20, to 20 meters or a kilometer, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. So yeah. it's always been a dubious claim. That's about the large bombs. And, um, and, uh, the other, and the second thing was, um, Mm. <clears throat> totally unrelated, but an interesting point. It was uh, these larger bombs. It wasn't until after the Net Evaluation Subcommittee that their real danger started to present itself. And their real danger was um, mass fires. So even though their blast damage was mitigated by, say, terrain, Yep. Uh, if it went off in Washington, D.C., just the hills, the fact that half of it's the ocean anyway, and then, and then it, the terrain mitigates that. But it was, it was the, uh, the massive long-distance flash fire damage that, was, that turned out to be the real uh, trouble with these things. And it was Robert McNamara who first started to uh, suggest that there was some calculation to be done about these very large multi-megaton weapons and their uh, and their wildfire effects, because uh, oh, it, it, the the specifics are off, especially about the the RDS two hundred and twenty, the largest, and it's impossible to get such data from the U.S. because because those big weapons were were out in the middle of the ocean. But uh, somewhere around 200 and 300 miles flash fires from the light itself. And so extraordinary. And then, of course, by the late 1970s, uh, you, you start to have the advent of the, um, of the nuclear winter theories from, from Carl Sagan and, and the TTAPS team. Uh, doing early computer modeling. And that's when you realize, well, of course, couldn't, couldn't have known, but if we started to drop these megaton weapons in the, in the late 50s, early 60s, well, the net evaluation subcommittee had absolutely nothing to say and couldn't have known. Uh, immediate damage and then the, this much broader global environmental scale trouble that was only experimented with in computer models in the 1980s. So unfortunately, no, the bigger the weapons, the more it seemed like the Soviets wouldn't use the weapons. Uh, But if they did, extraordinary new ways of causing trouble. So to link it back to what we were just talking about a few minutes ago, that 60% number was actually probably grossly undercalculated. It's very possible. Yeah, the the sixty percent was based yeah based not on on that. Well, I mean, I suppose once you get outside of the urban centers, oh, well, this is how this is how these cold and distance war games work. Is people like us we sit here and say, huh, is it undercalculated or or once once the fields in Iowa start burning, how many more people are really going to die? Probably not many, and so. Oh yeah, it's it's cold, cold and and amoral and apolitical. That's another thing, uh, which which we we can get into. But the the analysis um, was based entirely numerically until the end. And the reason, and we'll talk about the end of the the subcommittee. But the reason that the subcommittee did end was that they they started to divorce themselves from this from this analytical model that had served it well for a decade and got into politics and funding. Funding, always always that key thing that messes people up. So (laughs) Um, speaking of politics, I mean, and you mentioned a couple of minutes ago, um, Eisenhower uh, was fairly famously quite anti-nuclear in terms of his, his own personal stance. 
Mm-hmm. Um, never enough, obviously, to <clears throat> withdraw the U.S. from developing a massive arms spree. Um, but as the NESC numbers increased in their their, their size and you know, sort of that, that destructive level that's being estimated, how did that how did that increase affect affect Ike? Um, and I'm asking this question now because we'll come back around to the same similar kind of question, but talking about JFK, um, mm-hmm. but with, with Eisenhower, um, just curious as to how, how those escalating rapidly escalating numbers with the NESC reports affected, uh, Eisenhower either as president or if it, it's, it's included in, um, any of his personal memoirs, like how did that affect him personally? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> the, uh, without, without, uh, diving, let me see something. I'm trying, getting dim. I'll try to try to keep up my light. Um, without getting in into the memoirs or, or his or his diaries, the, these formerly he was very ver- very vocal, yeah. and I, are articulate and eager to be heard. Sometimes in a very humorous way, uh, gallows humor, and sometimes and sometimes quite quite seriously in these meetings. And so just talking about the documents we have available from these National Security Council meetings, uh, you can piece together a sort of a, a, a psychological profile about how he uh, viewed these things. Early, he's a military, a military man, uh, very, very much rooted as were all of these discussions and strategies and tactics in uh, World War II models. Yep. And then a little, you know, Korea was just, you know, World War, what did Tom Lehrer said, uh, World War II Part B. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, they, and, and they didn't see it fundamentally as anything different, anything other than a really big bomb. And that lasted for long enough to ingrain itself in policymakers' minds. Yep. Uh, the the first big change was pro- probably the, uh, the thermonuclear revolution when things became exponentially bigger. Mm-hmm. Then it started to look more like you couldn't just use your nuclear arsenal in a blanket scenario. But that didn't preclude the use of 10, 20, and 30 kilotons, which were war ending. You blow up yeah. one city, minimize your casualties, and the war is over. That's very appealing. And uh, he, uh, Eisenhower, um, through the early, these are the, the records of these early years of these analysis, he was still he was still that general seeing things as, well, how do you end that war as fast as possible? Minimum of casualties on both sides. And it was only when the, these assessments started to demonstrate that the Soviets had uh, an increasing number of mm-hmm. weapons and delivery systems that they would not hesitate to use, uh, that it, it you start to do that calculation. Now, I, uh, I never did this, but I can only imagine that people around him did. Well, what if the Japanese could retaliate? You know, one, uh, yep. a little midget sub into San Francisco. Well, that's that's ugly. And then it wasn't just one. It was 10 on their side, 10 in ours. And very quickly, it was 50 and 50 and 100 and 100. And, and so it was only a matter of a short number of years as these numbers increased that it didn't look very valuable to uh, it, it, to use this as a war ending technique his his comments uh, mentioned the argentine taking off for the argentine uh, at one point very uh 19 i wish i i don't want to get it wrong i'm sure that it's <laughs> I think, I believe it's 53 or 54. It's probably 1954, a little later. He said, how much, he asked the uh, the chair of the AEC, how, uh, how many megatons would it take to knock the earth off its axis? And somewhat incorrectly, but 
and he, he didn't have time, I think. He said uh, the chair of the AEC says 100 megatons would be close to the limit. And that was in the U.S. arsenal. That was ca- – we were capable. Yeah. And that was quite frightening. And uh, if there had ever been a thought, and there's no evidence that there was, that Eisenhower wanted a preemptive uh, – any kind of preemptive – strike or a threat or some kind of uh, some kind of nuclear blackmail to get the Soviets to just stop. Uh, it was certainly over by then. And that's very early. That's very, very early in the nuclear age. So Eisenhower, um, Eisenhower, just like m- much of the military and certainly a lot of the, the population, saw it as a a conventional weapon, a very large conventional weapon. But as the weapons got bigger and the arsenals got bigger, it became clear that uh, uh, that it was something more and something something more unusual than that. Yeah. I find so, that interesting too, because uh, because Truman seemed to intuit that very early on. He seemed um, in the first days when he found out found out about it. He seemed to get that there was something fundamentally different. But Eisenhower as a general, along with uh, what you see with the uh, with MacArthur and and yeah. other generals or or uh, or LeMay certainly into the sixties. That, that's uh, exactly who I was just thinking of. It's yeah. like Kurt, Kurt, Curtis LeMay were looking at you. So yeah. <laughs> yes. I just continued to see it as a tool uh, uh, instead of a uh, I, not not a moral or an ethical choice, but but something that just fundamentally transcends a tool or a or a military device. Um, but Eisenhower definitely sensed that, so he is not in that crowd of, of generals. Uh, I I would like to. It's a, it, it's impossible to know exactly when, but when you do look at the year upon year. Uh, mm-hmm. National Security Council minutes of this particular subject we're talking about, you you ju- you see that change on a on a twelve month cycle, and it's really apparent. Yeah. Interesting. That's yeah. um, one of the, as I was listening to your it's a four four episode series on the Net Evolution Subcommittee on Cold War Vault. Everybody remember write that down. Go go subscribe. Make sure you download and listen. Um, in, in one of the episodes, you, it's almost like you, you've included this, like a throwaway comment oh. where it, and it, it, it isn't, but it, it, it's a very offhand comment that you include that all of this is based around the idea that the players on both sides. So both the Americans and the Soviets, um, are all, all consist of rational, like rational players of the game. Um, and that's such a, especially in light of the destructive capability and whatnot, was there ever, ever scenarios run or developed based on the idea that irrational players may be involved in decision making? Not in the context of the net evaluation sub sub In, uh, in every, um, every page that's available, uh, from all of the years of its existence, there is, there are references to, um, and they, they are quite small or offhand to uh, to a terrorist act or a lone actor. Usually, in terms of bringing in a weapon to a port, there was almost always maritime. Their assumption, I think, was that it would be some kind of maritime thing. It, it's it's never it's never analyzed because. It, uh, it's never analyzed. It's it's never expounded upon, and uh, so it. I should say so. It does include uh, what you would call a terrorist act, or yeah. a lone actor, or a. Um, I believe, in at least one. This is also during Eisenhower, not at the end. What they imagined was it would be a opposed um, attack, a terrorist attack. So it would be the Soviets, but they would some, somehow set it up so it looked like somebody else to create some kind of diplomatic ruse. Yeah. Um, 
That so it's it is addressed, but it's not analyzed. Uh, it's certainly not analyzed to the point that anyone could take any action against it. Yeah. It's not taken as a serious threat, but only as one vector of attack. So a lot of these will say uh, um, they'll be broken out into well aerial attack, and then later uh, submarine launch, second wave attack, mm -hmm. uh, um, and so it's just sort of one vector of attack. Uh, they they simply did not see. Uh, it was such a high technology that they didn't see the world as it would start to exist after the disso dissolution of the Soviet Union, where um, people who didn't quite know how it was built could still turn the yeah. key. It's just not present at all. The, um, I mean, it's present in the way that I said, but it doesn't result in any kind of serious military planning or analysis. Okay. The, uh, I believe um, I mentioned something. Okay, I wrote something here about by 19. That's not true long after the subcommittee, but by 1983 and 84, that wasn't, that was a, a normal, that was a normal uh, approach to understanding what might happen or what might spark a war just in, in uh, strategic planning and war gaming. There was always something like, well, the uh, you see it in films, actually. Oh, the uh, Iranians or rogue elements of the Soviet military. So it became much more common. But at the time, it just seemed, uh, I think, it was either the Soviets pretending or wholly impossible <laughs> that a, uh, a Pakistani mili militant right. could get their hands on this thing the size of a Volkswagen Beetle and figure out how it explodes. <laughs> okay. That's so, I mean, even uh, like a do I'm thinking, I mean, Dr. Strangelove being that classic example, that's an, an yeah. it, it's an irrational act, but it's still within the scope of the two superpowers going toe to toe. Yes. Yes. Okay. Always. That's yeah. I can, uh, yes, always in that context, never a third, never a third actor ever. Um, that would become pretty normal in the 70s and 80s. Um, but yeah, I can't think of a, having read it at all, <laughs> I can't think of a single example yeah. where a third party, I really want to think about this. Even China was never mm -hmm. included. Once China, well, the, not the China didn't, hadn't developed nuclear capability by the time the net evaluation subcommittee was dissolved. So okay. that makes sense. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, but even as an ally, a post-1949 communist ally of the Soviet Union, they're just never included. So, Were, Did they ever run scenarios where an ally was included? And I'm thinking France specifically, but I guess France would be the, sort of on the same timeline as China in terms of its nuclear weapons development. <coughs> Thinking. So, yeah, the they the, the net evaluation. It's a good. That's actually a good question. The net evaluation subcommittee was almost entirely focused on continental U.S. Um, attacks by the Soviet Union. So it was the the net the net capabilities of the Soviet Union on the continental U.S. and and just uh, never never on the NATO allies. Okay. Um, there were some, uh, some, some passing lines that I, I can recall. I couldn't tell you when, uh, you know, uh, things like ha half of all of West Germany would be obliterated. Okay. You know, one line. So yeah, this was very much a, a, a one-on-one -on -one analysis. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we're talking about Eisenhower and sort of his views and opinions, Moving forward after JFK assumes office, um, by that point, obviously, that the, the scale of destruction is, I mean, 60% plus. It's, it's fairly, it's quite comprehensive. JFK himself was never a, a senior level military commander. He was, he was Navy, mm -hmm. um, but, I mean, small unit commander. Um, how do you think the NESC reports affected JFK 
um, especially in light of some of those most critical times um, during the Cold War, um, where war with the Soviets really did seem very real. I'm thinking like the Berlin crisis and then obviously the, the Cuban Missile Crisis. He loathed them. He despised the reports. Um, his general dismissal, he only got two of them, but his general mm. dismissal of the reports it was so, so visceral and that uh, it's misremembered a couple of times. So, well, I'll tell you this whole narrative and then we can see if we can figure out yeah. why he hated it. Because uh, uh, he, um, he, his first report, the 60, the 1961 mm -hmm. year report, it, uh, he received it. The there is no record of anything that was said or done, and uh, I couldn't quite believe that because even though it's before the presidential records rules, mm -hmm. um, you, you they they were usually very good about keeping things like that by this era, and uh, I went to in Boston. Yeah, you know, went to the JFK library, got up there, got, got my box going through the documents, and here it is. And the only reference to it, it's uh it's the title of one of those one of those episodes, I think, is um eleven copies destroyed. That's eleven of eleven. There were eleven copies. They were eyes only copies distributed yeah. to the National Security Council. They got the report, they were collected, all 11 were destroyed, were burned. That's it. I said to the archivist, who's a professional JFK archivist, that's going to be his whole career. He lives in this glass box up there. <laughs> and I, it's a very nice building. <laughs> but So it's a fun career to have. It's just a very limited, that's his whole world. Yep. He said, I've never seen anything like that. So in the in in his historical is his archival experience, and certainly in JFK, in the context of JFK, he'd never seen anything like it. And others uh, have agreed. It is an unusual document. Uh, it is a piece of paper, and it just has one line typed: "11 copies destroyed." So, whatever was in that particular, uh, and you kind of know the content because you've seen it for years and, and they have been declassified in whole or in part, or at least you can read the, um, uh, read the uh, memoranda on it. Whatever was in it, he was so st stunned and found it to be so inflammatory that he wanted nothing to do with it. Now you said that he received he re he received two of the reports. Was that the first one that he received or the second? First. And did, was first. the same was the same order given on the second report, or is there more? Uh, at least the memorandum exists for the uh, for the second. The second one is present. Now the second one he didn't attend, and to my uh, my recollection, he's it's the only time the president wasn't in attendance. There is an incorrect memory on in one uh, autobiography and I do not recall I'm it, sure it's in the episode um, but I just don't have it top of my head right now but uh, that uh, he he was there and he was so disgusted um, <laughs> by the uh, the poor performance of this Air Force general that he stood up and walked out that did happen but it wasn't the subcommittee report. That was another report he was disgusted <laughs> by. So these boring, he was very short, like he would draw, he would draw pictures and take notes and he was constantly writing, but not in a scholarly way. It was just, he was so bored by the people talking that he had to keep his mind ticking along. Right. So say people who knew him. Um, but he was not in, in attendance. That's a, that's a misremembrance on hmm. in one, uh, 
cabinet members part, he wasn't there. But that was the one, the 1962, that he uh, that the that the NESC presented something that had new political motivations, budgetary motivations. So instead of a, a straightforward analysis of uh, of the of the numbers and the net capabilities of the Soviet Union, it 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 branched off into three options and new weapons systems that we might have or need that the U.S. might need to counter them, and it was really just a sales pitch. And McNamara was so disgusted by it. Um, it was shut down. I have all the memos. It was, it was shut down within a week. Hmm. The uh, McNamara unilaterally ended the the uh, the net evaluation subcommittee after that because it had um, it had simply overstayed its usefulness. He said, "We have other committees, other groups doing m more thoughtful analysis." But really, he he saw he saw this power play from the Pentagon. And uh, and he wasn't going to have it, and uh, and that's it. So I I call it. I don't think I do there, but in in writing I've done on I call it institutional suicide. They <laughs> they just decided to put themselves in front of the train that was Robert McNamara, and they did not make it. And that and that and that's it. But uh, Kennedy don't have a lot of of evidence about his personal thoughts because he seems to just be so resistant to it. Yeah. So we know that destroyed one and we don't have any idea what he thought of it or what was in it. It'll, we'll never know. And, uh, and the second one, he didn't even go to it. And uh, in a third instance, probably similar material. Um, he was just so fed up that he got up and left the, uh, the cabinet room. So Kennedy, I don't know what his, why, what his motivation would have been. He doesn't, he, he never spoke out as some kind of radical anti-nuclear uh, uh, force in politics. But uh, what we do know about him in reference to these very, very sensitive reports, he, uh, he was having none of it. Interesting. Now we'll, we'll just fill fill that out. Say, did he did it? So did it in impact anything? Not Bay of Pigs because the timing's no. not right. Mm -hmm. And um, prob probably whatever whatever drove him to find that these reports were just absurd um, absurd. I, I what would you what you call it? Just exercises in in the macabre right that you know that they weren't useful what was useful was um di diplomatic and geopolitical maneuvering to make sure it never happened so i i think he probably saw them as a as an out outdated um yeah out outdated set of atrocities mm -hmm. that he didn't really need to be briefed on interesting almost Maybe I'm thinking too much into it, but almost it nothing he could do about it anyway. So make your decision, draw your draw your line in the ocean and hope mm. that hope that Khrushchev blinks. I think that well, I think that he um, I think that he thought <clears throat> that he could do something about it, but it mm. had nothing to do with understanding their net capability. And how right. many millions or tens of millions would yeah. die? That's that's good data to have uh, if you're on the fence. If you are somehow, like Lemay, still on the fence, uh, thirty million, uh, sixty, ah, but ninety, <laughs> that's too much. So there's a, yeah, there, there's a tipping point apparently. So well, I think Kennedy had. Um, I think Kennedy had come to that, uh, come to some kind of personal, personal understanding um, about it before uh, before he came into office. I just I'm not a, a Kennedy scholar, so I don't know his personal papers well yep. enough. 
but in the context of the net evaluation subcommittee, I know that uh, as soon as Eisenhower uh, was gone, its time was limited because Kennedy had no interest. Right. Okay. Um, so, I mean, one of the, as we're sort of wrapping up in terms of like towards the, the end of the lifespan of the NESC, I mean, part of its purpose obviously was determine like, you know, that there is a, there was a win condition, um, in the, the event of an exchange of nuclear weapons, um, yeah. as the fifties sort of wore on and into the sixties, the yeah. Soviet Union is achieving nuclear parity, um, in terms, I think the U.S. always had more individual devices, but in terms of destructive capability, I mean, once you're past that threshold of destruction, then, I mean, there's parity starts beginning to exist. Um, a, no, a nuclear exchange no longer becomes winnable. So, and this is going to sort of tie into what we were just talking about with um, George McNamara. Um, what does it mean for nuclear policy as the NESC is reporting that they, a win condition can't exist? Or, we assume that the NESC is reporting that a win condition can't exist. Um, it, it, may be, it may be more of a broader question in terms of sort of the shift in nuclear policy. Mm -hmm. um, let me make sure that this doesn't happen again while I'm talking. I heard a plunk. I heard a digital plunk. Ah, okay. Um, Okay, so it was never about, I, I, I think it's really important to, to point out that it was a much later, um, much later when the standards for winning a nuclear war were reduced to absurdity in the 1980s. Okay. When, when anyone was talking about winning. It was essentially we will reduce the Soviet Union to yeah and these and this is not in this is, wasn't Reagan ever that was all about uh, deterrence and exhausting yeah. military and industrial capacity, but generals were still uh, were still of the mindset that as long as you know there's one there's two of us and one of them we win. It was quite you know absurd. But uh, but that you get that in a lot of the writing about, about winning or some sort of um, final military superiority. And through the beginning, even from the beginning of the atomic age, uh, Truman and all through Eisenhower, through the net evaluation subcommittee, mm -hmm. it's more of a it's more of a calculus about military industrial balance. So it's not mm -hmm. that uh, there's any kind, there's not going to be. Um, a, a peace treaty signed in a rail car. There's not going to be a summit. It, 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 it's all about they quit fighting because they're just exhausted. They mm -hmm. don't have the weapons or they don't have the military or they don't have the will. And the U.S. can s start to build up its military uh, production capacity, its civilian steel, it's essential things, uh, agriculture, industrial production. Mm -hmm. And so it was really about this, <clears throat> this balance. Um, it was about the net outcome. That, okay. that was sort of how it was seen, um, as opposed to any, at least, yeah, very early on, at least anything like a, a military victory between the two powers. Nuclear weapons were still part of the calculation in straightforward old school military victories in places like Korea and even yep. as late as Vietnam there were people advocating for the use of small tactical nuclear weapons. But as far as uh, the Soviet Union itself, Warsaw Pact, the United States and NATO coming to blows, um, it, it was more about who could exhaust the other one first and that would constitute some form of victory. Um, when As far as nuclear weapons policy, I, I mean, because it was so early, it became clear that um, that peace through strength was the way forward. Mm -hmm. Eisenhower, certainly. Kennedy, it's impossible to say as a driving force, he just wasn't there long enough. And Johnson, of course, as a, was so distracted 
by Southeast Asia. But there are very important people there, McNamara. Mm -hmm. And so we can look at McNamara as a as a driving force in policy. And uh, and he he, of course, saw the logical conclusion to peace through strength, which was uh, peace through mutual suicide, not just exhausting the other side, but assuring that the other side wouldn't survive in any meaningful way, not only as a nation state, but but as a as a people. Uh, pretty extreme. I don't think McNamara ever, you know, ever gamed that out as a legitimate policy because it was all about deterrence. And then deterrence then, you know, goes on. Did the net evaluation subcommittee, I think you can see that, uh, did it have something to do with policy? Yes. Very, uh, it had to, it, you see weapons development yep. uh, driven by it. You see, um, certainly delivery driven by it and missiles, missiles, missiles. The entire space program probably owes its, uh, owes its uh, origin, sure, lots of things, but if, if you really go into that room with Eisenhower mm -hmm. and, and you get that report uh, about, well, they don't, right now they have no missiles. But in five years, they'll have 200 missiles and they can all hit any city in the U.S. Well, that really drove a, a new missile program in the 1950s. And, uh, and that came from the analysis that was done in the Pentagon for, for the National Security Council. Um, weapons technology, delivery technology, um, and that was a good lesson because a lot of money got spent on those two things. And that's why by 1962, the, uh, the generals and admiral at the head of the net evaluation subcommittee said, well, it had worked. And we, now we have a space program because we have intercontinental ballistic missiles because we scared Eisenhower and we have new planes and we have um, you know, giant bombs and uh, any kind of, well, maybe we should try this. And they did. They tried uh, new, uh, it was three, di three different paths, three different global geopolitical strategies, all involving huge amounts of money. And that's, that's when McNamara put it on the chopping block. So, uh, so it did drive policy, not the obvious policy, like you would think right. uh, uh, nuclear policy. No, because from a very early time, it was clear that nuclear war was going to be so messy. It's so much cheaper, safer, cleaner, easier to fight those nuclear wars without nuclear weapons in Southeast Asia by proxy in Afghanistan. Yep. And... Um, and, uh, and that is the way that, that the world played out. I think in large part, and I, I do, don't think that these things were uh, obscure or secret to anyone above a certain level. This was, this was the textbook, the body of knowledge, these, these reports. And I think, that, I think that they painted a picture of a, a, a war scenario between the superpowers that was if not unwinnable, certainly so costly that it was uh, it was not worth your job, you know, not not worth your 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 division, not worth the whole nation's army or navy, and uh, I think it convinced a lot of people in ways that we really didn't know until uh, these documents were declassified, right? Uh, relatively recently. Well, you know what that that I mean you've. You've just actually answered my last question, PJ, because, I mean, what I was going to ask is, like, we, we've gone through sort of, you know, like you've explained sort of how the, the NESC sort of wrapped, wrapped itself up, um, not intentionally, but... Yes. Um, Probably not. <laughs> my, my, my final question was going to be, what is its legacy? But that, I mean, you've very much just neatly tied that up. I mean, it's... I hope. I, yes, I, I think that's a good, that'd be my end. That's a good 
good answer, the That's, legacy. So, so for the viewers, there's the question. Now just wind back a few minutes, listen to DJ's okay. answer, and, and there we go. Okay. Um, I'll tell you one um, one thing you might not include, but it's certainly something I would tell you. And and uh, it's, it's, it's different. It's, it's after these d declassifications. When you can see the personal response, this is largely about Eisenhower, but to some extent Kennedy, but mostly Eisenhower. Uh, it exhibits a level of uh, humanity and human understanding that I think when political, when politics, politicians, the military became so demonized in large part because of uh, the escalations in the Cold War and then of course Vietnam and Southeast Asia and then the absurd uh, uh, really frightening rhetoric of the 1980s on the part of Reagan, but also Thatcher and others, mm -hmm. they became really demonized. And I think it's really one great thing that came out of this for historians, but also just anyone interested in presidential politics or policy is to look back at this. These are unfiltered, super secret. No one was going to see him. He wasn't performing. And when he said things like, like, uh, we can't go on like this. Uh, that meant something to him, and it, it means something. And so the, the declassification, well, I should also say, he also said, let's go on, which is quite <laughs> a bit active. But the declassification of uh, documents like this uh, is so essential, not just to understanding individuals, but to understanding and humanizing uh, individuals, groups, and whole political classes of people, um, they it get lost in the, in this very black and white narrative over time. And you realize that uh, Eisenhower didn't want a nuclear war any more than you do or your grandmother did or your kids do. Nobody wants it. He didn't want it. And, uh, and that's clear, but only when you have the documents, only when you can declassify yeah. those documents. And only when they're made available to the to the public. That's another legacy, just in my own personal work. But the legacy, uh, yeah, you can patch that together. I'm Absolutely. becoming I'm becoming a shadow here. <laughs> Capture is good on this side, so that's DJ. This has been fantastic. I really appreciate uh, the time that you've uh, been willing to to give to us, taking away from you know, I say from your your professor, your teaching, from like you know. Your podcast um again that podcast name cold war vault like seriously everybody go out there subscribe to it listen to it you will learn an immense amount about uh, the cold war and nuclear policy there's a fascinating series on the nuclear test at Chitka island which was revelatory for myself uh, when i listened to them um definitely excellent work um dj uh please um your 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 production your media um company Tell us a bit about that, please. Sure. Um, uh, Mars Dog, uh, I, I hope to... You've disappeared. Oh, my. Oh. Let's try again. Mars Dog, uh, I hope to be able to create a platform uh, with all of the problems solved for uh, new scholars that yep. want to do something like a podcast, an audio book, or yep. even traditional print media. There are so many hoops that I've gone through uh, over the last 25 years of scholarly media trying to, um, trying to solve these problems. I've solved them. And I know that when I finished um, a master's and then later the PhD, I knew that I wanted uh, something uh, something richer and more than a traditional tenure track job yep. at a small institution for the sake of saying that I had a tenure track job. And I, and uh, I wanted to publish books and put out uh, stories. It was about telling stories and teaching in unconventional ways. And so I hope I've solved those uh, problems for people that might want to send me uh, an email and communicate through yep. the Cold War Vault. And, and uh, with your idea, there is, uh, there is uh, some government funding 
uh, which I'm excited about. And, and so uh, I just want to talk to like-minded individuals who want to further their careers in new and unconventional ways. Excellent. Well, it's, um, that, that, uh, and what's the address that people can reach you through? Is that uh, Cold War Vault? Mm -hmm. um, DJ at coldwarvault.com is, uh, is the best way right now because the, the biggest production for Mars Dog media is the cold war vault though there's some exciting stuff coming down the pipe but um you know don't want to talk too much about it we'll jinx it no absolutely we'll uh we'll certainly we'll have that uh, email address and everything linked in the show notes um so everybody out there please go check it out check out the podcast um this has been fantastic for me dj i really appreciate the time uh taking uh giving up some of your time for your free time to, to uh to Cold War Channel. Um, thank you very much for joining us, and uh, we uh, we hope that uh, we can uh, have you on again soon. I've been, uh, I, this has been so enjoyable. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, and have a wonderful day. All right.